Hello, Jeff. Well, hello, Will. How are you? I'm very well. Good. How are you? I'm doing very well. What's it like in Chapel Hill? It's beautifully sunny and ridiculously hot. <laughs> so it's about 90 right now. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like you're having about the same weather we are here in uh, the Imperial Capital. Yes. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thanks for coming on uh, Free Will again, uh, Jeff. Uh, I'm Will Wilkinson at the Cato Institute. I have with me uh, Jeffrey Sayer McCord, professor of philosophy at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And this is the second time we've done this. Uh, we uh, talked uh, about a month or so ago, and at the end of it, I suggested that, well, we would wanted to talk about uh, the uh, effect of evolutionary thinking on uh, contemporary moral philosophy, uh, but we didn't get around to it, and uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Excellent. That sound good? Yes, it does. Uh, so uh, let's not dilly dally then. Uh, let's just get right into it. Um, so I, I mean, I think it's kind of there, there's a big you know segment of the American population who is apparently quite skeptical of evolutionary thinking, but that's not. The you know the educated consensus uh, I, I would say is that sort of some version of Darwinian natural selection is true. There's a I guess what what's the what do they call it the 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 the, the something synthesis you know the the the, the view that it, it integrates the genetic view of inheritance with the sort of Darwinian view and so on and so forth right so the, there's the modern Darwinian synthesis is. Uh, I think nowadays, pretty much the consensus view of educated intellectual people, including philosophers. Uh, I, I that. think that's right, and certainly for our discussion, I was assuming we would take that for granted. Yeah, so we're so we're taking that for granted. Um, people who think that uh, we're all touched by an angel um, can uh, regard this as a peculiar uh, anthropology experiment. Uh, see what see what this strange university types think. Well, even if you thought we were touched by an angel, you might think that the touch of the angel then set in motion everything that Darwin has to, mm -hmm. to talk about. So it's an right. even more special group who will find it a peculiar anthropological investigation. That's right. I mean, that that is in fact this official Catholic view these days, isn't it? Yeah, I believe, well, <laughs> I'm no expert, but I think that's right. Yeah, that, I, I think it is. That, that the way God managed creation is by setting in motion this natural process. Um, but uh, enough about that. So uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what moral philosophers, or does what problems does a sort of thoroughgoingly Darwinian view of human nature present uh, for moral philosophers, Jeff? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little and not take so that question. Yeah, well, I, I, I'd like to characterize evolution's relation to morality mm -hmm. as falling somewhere on a continuum set by two extremes, at least if we're thinking about what most people think the relation has got to be. Okay. So on the one hand, th there have been, for a long time, certainly since Spencer, a lot of Herbert Spencer, a lot of people who thought that evolution and natural selection work to set the standard of morality. That discovering what was evolutionarily advantageous, discovering what was fit and would survive and would propagate was discovering what was good or what was right or what was worth uh, engendering. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other extreme, at exactly the same time, by people equally informed about evolution, there have pe been people who thought that evolutionary theory, if it's true, sounds the death knell for morality. That mm -hmm. if indeed uh, natural selection is the force that shapes our character and determines our actions, then there's no room for morality whatsoever. And both of those extremes starting in the 1800s, have been vibrantly represented until today. And so I'm, I think I'm interested in thinking about why both of those extremes seem wrong and what evolution has to both 
evolutionary theory has to contribute and what problems it faces. And well, let, let me, yeah, let me see if I can give you, uh, here, I'm going to give you an argument for the, for the first Sets the standard. Side of the side side of this uh, these poles, right? Okay. The idea that that, that evolution uh, uh, is the basis for normativity. Okay. All right. So, you know, we live in a, we live in an empirical world. Uh, it, it, we're not created by God. There's no sort of transcendental facts that are kind of beyond the empirical realm, uh, and so. One thing that's completely mysterious is how there's anything like normativity in the world at all. It's mysterious how there's, you know, that, that there exists any, you know, why ought we do anything, right? Like, how could there be facts about what we ought to do? Mm -hmm. uh, well, here's one source of normativity. So when you learn about evolution, you learn that things have natural functions. And there's a big literature in philosophy uh, in the last 20, 30 years on on, uh, on functions, and that, and so you can find out that the function of the heart is to pump blood. And there's, uh, you know, who are the people like uh, Larry Wright and Ruth Millikan right. have views on sort of on, on on Darwinian accounts of natural functions. And so there's a certain kind of natural Darwinian basis for a kind of teleology. So you can say that there is something that the heart is for. Right. Right? That's to pump blood. And you can also say, in a naturalistically respectable way, that there's something that an individual organism is for, and that's to maximize its inclusive fitness. That's to sort of... I mean, Standard just, gloss. Right. Yeah, that's to maximize the, the, the proportion, the, the number of its genes in future generations. Um, and and, and th we can give that a, a, a non-sort of mystifying or... Um, numinously religious basis. Uh, here's here's an account of functions and ends, and here's what hearts are for. Here's what lungs are for. Here's what uh, Homo sapiens are for. Uh, it's for propagating their genes. We are vehicles for genes, right. and so things that maximize our inclusive fitness are good for us. Um, just like not having too much cholesterol in the circulatory system is good for it, and that's it. How, what's wrong with that? Um, I, well, this is a very nice setup, but, <laughs> and, and the end, the way you said things at the end, raises the kind of a kind of worry that I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, think of the hard example. Um, the point of the approach is to find a context within which it makes sense to locate the heart as having a function in light of which we can talk about it functioning well or not. And as you say, uh, it functions well when it plays the role it's naturally selected for in the circulation system. An interesting thing to notice about the heart doing its function is it doesn't follow from that in any interesting sense that it's fulfilling its function is good for it. Mm -hmm. There's an exact parallel with people. If you take uh, a strong inclusive fitness view, according to which what people are for is to be vehicles of the propagation of their genes, um, in a mechanism that is working to select the most, uh, the fittest collection of genes in the future, then we're playing our proper role from that point of view when we uh, prove to be fit, inclusively fit. Um, but it doesn't at all follow that being such is good for us. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very interesting divide between the question, when are we good for the thing of which we're a part? And when is being good for that good for us? Yeah, well, so I, this depends on what you think, you know, us is or, you right. know. <laughs> so, so because you can say, um, you can look at me, you know, here here I am, a three-dimensional object. And, uh, and you can say, think of will, you know, qua animal, right? Uh, you know, right. I'm an organism. So, you, you know, so what's good for it as an organism uh, it seems like that's the, you know, like, as an organism, I, I have a function. But then you can also say, will 
qua person, uh, and I, and I, you know, I'm a, so I'm a center of subjectivity, and I have ends, and I have hopes and dreams and fears, and it might be that what's good for this organism isn't necessarily good for the person that kind of resides in it in some sense. Well, I was thinking at least that the point I was making would apply to you qua organism too. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, activities and behaviors of you considered simply as an animal leaving outside the aspects of you that make you a subject in the world. Things might be good for the system of which you're a part, might be good Mm -hmm. for the propagation of the genes, but not good for you as an organism. Mm -hmm. So often, well, I don't know about often, but not infrequently, uh, inclusive behavior that's contributes to inclusive fitness involves your death. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, But how can you say that that's bad? If that's what the organism is for, so it's doing its job, it's, it's, it's doing its role by dying. You know, so, so, you know, we are referring to cases where, like, if I have to choose between my own life and uh, eight nephews, right. uh, that it's, I, let's say ten nephews, because I can't do the math in my head. Uh, <laughs> eight nephews might be a wash. Right. <laughs> Uh, but uh, to, you know, I have to choose between my own life and ten nephews. That will be uh, I'll maximize my inclusive fitness if if they um, survive rather than me. But it, it seems to me there's still no sense in which it's good for you, good for the particular individual animal you are, that they survive. So you would say just like the good for this sort of like four dimensional object is just. Well, it isn't it's determined its by its playing its role. Yeah, so what would be good for me as an animal would just be to persist. Well... Is that the alternative? I meant to be neutral. I meant mm-hmm. to leave open... So I just wanted to press the following idea. Okay. To, de- to, to figure out what you're good for by finding your role in a functional role in a system mm-hmm. isn't yet to determine what's good for you. Whatever you are. Now, there may be some things about which it's right to say there's no such thing as what's good for them. So if you thought value for an individual depended on subjectivity, Mm -hmm. then you might end up saying that, you know, a stream might play its role in the ecosystem and be a good stream thanks to its playing that role, and yet there would be nothing good for the stream. Mm -hmm. When you move to animals, to lions and horses and dogs, it it does look as if there's sense to be given to talking about what's good for them. And that's separate from how inclusively fit their behavior turns out to be. So we we can have a a notion of the health of the organism that's independent of its... Exactly. you You know, Feeding that is bad for your horse because it'll make it, you know, sick. Right. Break it. You know, they so recently there's this controversy about the breeding of racehorses because there's mm-hmm. the suspicion that interbreeding has increased their propensity to uh, weak bones in the front legs, for instance. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about whether that's in fact true, but you could easily see an argument that says... Yeah. The interbreeding is bad for the horse that's the product of it. Even if having horses like that is great for the racing system. Okay, yeah, so if we're thinking just in a completely inclusive fitness sense of good for, then you'd have to say that it's nonsense to say that anything is good for an organism that is past reproductive age and past the, and no longer in a position to help any of its kin. That's exactly right. That's one of the upshots of, of trying to go full bore with the view you were setting out. Right. So so if, if I if I'm a if I'm a dog, I'm a ten year old dog, uh, and I, I you know I'm not fertile anymore, can't have any puppies, I can't help care for puppies, uh, then there's some sense in the hard Darwinian sense, there's there's no fact of the matter about what's good for me anymore. I've already I've already fulfilled my function. Um, but of course that's nonsense because we can you know, people have ten year old dogs and they know that uh, it's bad when they're, you know, they get hip dysplasia or something like right. that. And you don't just have to think about 10-year-old dogs here. There's various people who've passed the point of reproduction. 
either thanks to operations or menopause or just simply age. And yet it makes, it seems as if it makes good sense still to talk in normative terms about what might be good for them or bad for them about different ways to go on with their life. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, so as, as a, you know, an easy example, suppose uh, you're from the other side of the world and uh, your family drops you off at an orphanage in, you know, you're, you're born in India and you're dropped off in an orphanage in Chicago. You have no way of knowing anybody who you're related to. You grow up and it turns out that you just happen to have some disorder that makes it so that you can't ever have children. Right. So you have no relationship to anybody who's close enough, you know, related to you closely enough for you to do anything for them. You'll never have kids. Um, still, there's things that are good for you, right? So it seems. Yeah. And, and so it does... I think I think uh, I shouldn't just say so. It seems it seems to me absolutely clear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. So it, it's darned obvious. Right. Yeah. If you're going to bite a bullet defending the relevance of evolutionary theory, I don't think it ought to be on that hard evolutionary view that you sketched, which identified good for an individual with uh, evolutionary function of that individual. Um, and, and now, Jeff, there's a lot of people that are still very, you know, not so. So that's that's an, you know, a really extreme version that's so implausible that I think very few people actually believe that. Um, but a lot of people, I think, do believe a sort of like softer version of this. And I encounter this in internet debates a lot, uh, especially pertaining to uh, w- when you come up with with a when you're having a debate about the persistence of sexism mm-hmm. or something like that, uh, and, and so. You know, you'll, some statistic comes out about the uh, the different number of young men and young women who have gone into engineering or something like that. And you have a lot of people argue uh, that, well, you know, look, uh, men and women are sort of constituted differently, our psychologies are different, and they'll sort of argue that that's kind of normative, that we ought to do different things with our lives because uh, of... The, the separate, the different roles that we play in the biological process of reproduction, uh, and uh, and so it's and, and, and so sometimes you get arguments that it's really really harmful to women, for example, to give them the idea that they should be working their hardest through their twenties to uh, achieve academic and professional success. Um, because if they do that, then they'll have passed their prime childbearing years. Bearing children is really what women are for, and so, and that's therefore what they're going to find the greatest satisfactions in life from. So we're actually being cruel and wrong to push women into doing something that defies the function for which they have evolved. Mm-hmm. So there's a nice two-step move there. Mm-hmm. In, an, in an argument, I want to resist pretty strongly. Mm -hmm. But the two-step move was to uh, first make a claim about what women are for that is Mm -hmm. a putative evolutionary claim. So it's not just that what they do biologically is bear and nurture the kids, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that that's their purpose. And one thing to think about there is, again, the difference between the the role their biology allows them to play, the playing of which contributes to evolutionary fitness, and what's their proper role, the particular individual, which might well be tied to what's good for her. Mm -hmm. But then the next step, it's a quick step, was the step from what women putatively are for to what will give them the greatest satisfaction. Which was I, fe- I felt dirty. Yeah, <laughs> making uh, making that move. Well, you you were representing, I think, the yeah. arguments that people give. Mm-hmm. But it is dirty mm-hmm. because it is then the move to really the relevant argument, which is completely contentious at the individual level. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, the so you, you do work on happiness mm-hmm. and. My understanding is a bunch of that research seems to show of many people, I'm pleased to say it didn't seem to be true of me, that having children is counterproductive from the agent's 
point of view often. Mm-hmm. That people go into having kids thinking this will make me happy, and the evidence mm-hmm. seems to be on average it doesn't. Yeah, there's a very, there's a very mild and negative correlation between having kids and and uh, and your and your self-reported happiness. And in fact, it goes up. Like the more kids you have the stronger the negative relationship <laughs> is. Uh, when until, you switch to zone defense from man until, on man. Until you, yeah, until you, get the, until you get to the basketball team. Right. And, and, then, and, then, and then it kind of starts like, now you've got economies of scale and then the marginal kid, you know, you, don't, you barely even know. Yeah, I didn't know that kid was mine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who are you? So, you live here. So, so we go back to the two steps. When you move to the claim that in fact, this will give you the greatest satisfaction. Now you're making a, a relevant normative argument, but mm-hmm. not supported by, not supported directly by the evolutionary theory. Mm-hmm. It doesn't follow that when you're playing your evolutionarily advent, advantageous from the point of view of evolution role, that you're doing a role that will be most satisfying for you. Mm-hmm. It does seem to me, though, also true that setting up ideals for people that misfit them, Mm -hmm. claiming of them that they should be a certain way when they not only aren't but can't be, is its own deep moral problem. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are all sorts of worries about, in the first instance, thinking you should pick a single role and say that's what people should be like, and then castigating people who can't possibly be that way. Either successful through the profession, despite mm-hmm. having kids, or uninvolved in their family, or whatever your particular ideal might be. I agree completely. But here, here's something. I hear. Okay, I'm softening it a little okay. bit. Um, here, which, which I think is pretty plausible to maybe most people. Uh, which is that you know most people who you know have some sort of idea of our being evolved that our evolutionary history is going to be responsible for all sorts of dispositions, all sorts of preferences, all sorts of tastes, and that we defy our evolutionary sort of history or our evolved nature yeah. at our peril. Um, so, and, and, and so here's you know, kind of a softer version of the argument I just made. Um, you know, m- it's millions of years, or hundreds of thousands, or how many ever years of uh, evolution have shaped the minds of men and women to play a certain kind of role. Uh, for women, for example, that is bearing and nurturing children, uh, and so the desire to bear children is going to be incredibly strong, and the satisfactions that come from raising them, whether or not that shows up in a you know happiness Study survey, or not. Yeah. Uh, is is going to be very very deep. And so that it's that we should be conservative. That it would be incredibly incautious and imprudent to um, to uh, to set up social norms that would discourage women or make it difficult for them to do this thing that that is probably going to be such a a profound they have such a profound drive for and such a profound source of satisfaction. Is that a more plausible version of that? I think it is, though. It's. Yeah, I, so, so I do think it's completely right that we defy our nature at our peril. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, I, th- I think sometimes the right thing to do is defy our, our nature in various ways. And let me try to make that plausible. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, just as it looks plausible that there are various evolutionary stories behind uh, our extraordinary attraction to infants. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you have, when we had our kids, pre-having kids, I thought of babies as not especially interesting or engaging. Then we had kids, and I was just locked on with fascination on our boys, Mm -hmm. each one. And I can't help but believe there's some biological story of that affection. Mm -hmm. Um, just as there's a biological story of my affection for coffee and my affection for coffee ice cream and my affection mm-hmm. for chocolate-covered coffee beans. <laughs> there's got to be a biological story behind that. Yeah. Um, but so, too, with aggressiveness, with envy, 
with resentment, mm. with the urge to uh, lash out at those who frustrated our aims. And, and so it, it would not surprise me that it's in our nature in the same way, and there's an evolutionary story behind all sorts of dispositions people have and desires people have that are nonetheless reasonably thought to be just the things we ought to try to define, Mm -hmm. that we ought to try to restrain. Mm -hmm. Now, to discover that it's... I think we used to call that civilization. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So if you're going to grant that there are some desires, urges, and behaviors that have biological roots with an evolutionary story behind them that we ought to try to resist, stand against, and oppose, then to point out that childbearing falls in that same category Mm -hmm. doesn't yet settle what our attitude towards it should be. Yeah, I was using childbearing as the example because that's the one I I hear hear come up the most. But but here's, here's a very closely related a case where people obviously think that we ought to resist or that the, that the social norm that keeps us from exercising our natural proclivity is obviously right. Uh, so for, throughout our evolutionary history, uh, it, it seems that, uh, that uh, men would impregnate young women up just upon the age of their reproductive viability. Mm-hmm. So uh, in most places and most times, a, a, a girl menstruates and then she's fair game. For um, for marriage and motherhood, uh, so uh, uh, but we have incredibly strong taboos against men, sort of our age, having sex with fourteen year olds, um, and that is probably in defiance of our nature, um, and it's also an excellent thing. Right. I mean, that's another example, like the resistance to aggression. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I I think we're on the same page. So I I think an argument that moves from the naturalness of a desire or an urge to the appropriateness of acting on it or mm-hmm. the importance of respecting it is a big mistake. So that when people argue to you, oh, well, women are, uh, for evolutionary reasons, inclined to uh, take care of young kids, that shouldn't be taken as an argument that establishes resisting that either resisting against your nature or finding yourself not having the urge, um, it shouldn't be taken as a good argument for thinking it's a mistake not to have kids. Mm -hmm. You Uh, need a different argument. I don't mean to be, you know, settling the issue one way or the other. Yeah. But it just is not enough to establish that there are biological roots and evolutionary advantages Mm -hmm. of the desires in question. Now, so... it's one thing to say that um, our sort of our, our craving for something is going to have an evolutionary basis because all our psychological dispositions and uh, and traits and capacities have an evolutionary disposition. Um, you mean an evolutionary basis? Yeah. yeah. Ha, ha, sorry, an evolutionary basis. There's a history to it, um, and uh, and so and so the the question is which and so there's this, an extent to which the ends that we set for ourselves. Right, the things that we're going to find appealing are going to have. There's going to be a reason we find them comp- appealing, right. and the mechanism through which we developed in the way that we did, so that we would find them appealing, is was 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 evolution. Um, but uh, but the fact that we evolved just doesn't give those ends authority by itself, and so it becomes a, a weird. So how is it that they do come to have authority? So here's here's one that. You know, you could play the same card as against the child molestation, or, or, uh, or, or, or you you have to have children because that's what you're for. I think human beings have a, a very deep urge to live, um, to ha- have a very strong sense of social embeddedness, right. to live very closely with one another, and that that ki- I, I call this the communitarian craving, and that people want to live in sort of a very thickly interconnected sort of social networks. Uh, and they derive a lot of meaning and a lot of satisfaction from that. But I also think it can be harmful in important ways. Right. Um, and, uh, and so people who appeal to natural human sociality 
to say that uh, a lack of social cohesion in an individualist society is a problem might be making the same error as somebody who says, well, you know, I ought to be able to sleep with 14-year-olds because it's natural. I think, How about that? I, th- I, I think you're completely right. I think the implications of the arguments we've been exploring so far are that you can't move legitimately from the naturalness of to the goodness of indulging in. So the naturalness of the communitarian craving to the goodness of indulging that craving. That's the move that I think is is rightly called into question in every case where the arguments are given. Now... Uh, okay, but, but then how do we have morality at all? Well, so, but that point is separate from the point you press on the way to it, which mm-hmm. was, well, okay, if we're not going to get the value of the ends we have from their naturalness, from their being evolutionarily given, mm-hmm. which is, in effect, one of the things we've been arguing. You can't take the mere fact that somebody one person wants to rape others or one person wants to dominate others or one person wants to retaliate against others, you can't take that as showing that what they're aiming to do is valuable in any way. Mm -hmm. But then you say, well then, from whence cometh the value of various ends, if not from evolutionary advantage? Yeah. Um, And that's... nicely the topic of the, our last conversation <laughs> that we didn't we, you know, the meta-ethical issue mm-hmm. is how to understand the normative aspects of our thinking and I think it dovetails nicely with one way of thinking about the challenges posed by evolution so I might just flag what I'm thinking here um, yeah. without giving you a satisfying answer. So it it seems to me that as you come into the issue of what does evolution have to do with morality, you're coming into it already with a more or less developed common sense appreciation of what morality prescribes and proscribes. Mm-hmm. Um, and one way to think of morality's claims there are that they have to do with, first of all, certain behaviors, second of all, with certain capacities, the the presence of the capacity, in effect, to do as you will. Um, That not only does morality seem to... Not only does morality, if it's legitimate, require that you treat people justly, it also limits its scope to people who have some control over their behavior. Mm -hmm. So to discover of someone that their behavior was out of their control beyond their will is to discover that excuse and pity are relevant, Mm -hmm. not condemnation or praise. Then the final thing is it, it morality involves the capacity to think in moral terms, to think in normative terms. To be able not just to notice of something that you want it, but to notice whether what you want is good or appropriate or right. And a way of thinking about the question you've asked is, what are we doing when we're thinking in normative terms? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between something satisfying the non-normative descriptive characterization concept, what I'm seeking, Mm-hmm. and satisfying the normative concept worth pursuing. Mm-hmm. And one of the big issues, the thing I'm working on now that is occupying a lot of my time is trying to understand whether there can be an enlightening evolutionary story of the emergence of those concepts. Mm-hmm. And it's the way I'm thinking about it now is it's in very interesting ways parallel to the question, how is it we have the capacity to think in mathematical terms? Because hmm. our mathematical concepts are not directly empirical concepts. The truth of various mathematical claims isn't beholden to the workings of the world. So, for instance, you might think, well, 
we know 1 plus 1 equals 2 by going out in the world and adding a cup of this to a cup of that and ending up with two cups. Um, interestingly, I've been told, I've never actually tested this, but if you take a cup of water and a, a cup of alcohol and you add them together, you don't end up with two cups of liquid. And that doesn't show that one I've, plus... I've tried it in my stomach. Have you? And what did you discover? I, 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 I just don't have an internal measurement. System, oh, that's so. that's a problem. I felt better. It does have that effect, but you yeah. felt better with less liquid, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it, supposing that's true, that one cup of water plus one cup of alcohol doesn't equal two cups of liquid, doesn't refute the claim that one plus one equals two. Or similarly, that we've never actually seen a perfect triangle mm -hmm. whose internal angles add up to exactly 180 degrees and whose sides are formed by perfectly straight lines doesn't in any way call into question the legitimacy of geometry. Mm -hmm. And yet there's this really important question. Why do we have these concepts? What's distinctive about mathematical concepts so that we can think about the world in mathematical terms and not merely in empirical terms. Well, is, is, that, is that actually a separate question from why do we have a capacity for abstraction at all? Uh, because when I think, uh, when, when I deploy, uh, you know, just any ordinary concept, I'm abstracting away from lots of uh, inessential features of, you know any members of the referent group, right. uh, and so and, and and so if my 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 conception of a dog might be that it has four legs, but a three-legged dog doesn't refute, you know, d you know d doesn't really do anything to my concept of the dog. Uh, I mean, I, I'm just wondering if there's anything special about the mathematical case, and maybe it's just because I'm a I'm a a, a crazy empiricist. Well, I'm a pretty uh, crazy empiricist too. So, <laughs> and, and, and you know, I'm tempted to think of mathematical truths as just the limiting case of abstraction. That 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 right. that, that they're actually that they actually do describe the world, but at, at, at a in a uh, that the concept we're deriving the concepts from experience in some way, but we're abstracting away uh, everything. Almost. Well, I think I think my own crazy empiricism is it's got to be that there's a story from experience to the possession of these concepts, mm -hmm. um, and I think there's the story is going to be whatever turns out to be the right story of abstraction. Mm -hmm. But since there are a bunch of different abstract concepts we derive from experience. Mm -hmm. that are in very interesting ways different from each other. Yeah. Uh, geometrical, from arithmetic, from normative, from color, from shape. That a story of abstraction is part of the story, mm -hmm. but then you want to ask, once you have on the table the capacity to abstract, how does that capacity then get bent and shaped mm -hmm. so as to allow us to think in normative terms? Or in mathematical terms, mm -hmm. or in doggy terms. Um, an interesting thing that, that I think you you agree with is even if you have a story of the um, genesis of the concepts in experience, the concepts that emerge have a status that makes them no longer answerable to experience. Um, so, for instance, as you said, your concept of a dog might include as typical or mm -hmm. stereotypical four legs but discovering of a bunch of dogs they all have three legs mm -hmm. doesn't doesn't belie the truth of the concept the appropriateness of your concept mm -hmm. it may eventually make your concept useless right so if it turned out through a genetic fluke fewer and fewer dogs had four legs and it was more and more the norm to have three mm -hmm to keep mobilizing a concept that had built in four legs would be a problem. Similarly, you could imagine mathematical thinking becoming not very useful, depending on how the world worked, or normative thinking. But in each case, I'm tempted by the idea that trying to figure out 
why we have these concepts, what what function they play, to pick up on our earlier discussion, will give us insight into their structure. So it's it, one of the interesting things about moral concepts, then, is that they are such that, uh, so you know, we, might, we might agree that the reason our minds evolved the way it did was because our minds evolving the way it, they did was conducive to fitness, or else they wouldn't have evolved that right. way. Um, but the the function of a particular concept uh, isn't... The content of the concept. The, the content of the concept isn't to sort of improve our fitness, or else it wouldn't be sensible to say that it's morally wrong to do something that's evolutionarily sort of mandated. That's right? exactly right. That's exactly right. You don't want to move from the functional advantages of the concept to the content of the concept. So our, right, so our so mathematical try. concepts are not concepts of evolutionary fitness. That's right. Though, That's right. though there is, I, I'm supposing, an evolutionary story of the capacity to think in mathematical terms. But I think in the, in the particularly moral case, part of what you're trying to do is, is explain what, what is a good sort of Darwinian account of the function of concepts that allow us to make judgments that ap- actually trump the the function for which the whole system was evolved to serve, right. uh, and so we so I think it's you know I might you know nobody thinks it's wrong so I might actually think that it's wrong to do something that would be conducive to my fitness. Right. Uh, why would I develop a system that would lead me you know qua organism to stop myself from doing something that would be good evolutionarily? I think that is. I don't have an answer to that. Mm-hmm. I th- it seems like a design flaw, uh, doesn't it? Or is there some other function that it, you 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 know because it, it's giving us that um, a, a degree of freedom, right? We can we, we so we have the capacity to stop ourselves from doing things that would be good qua organism, right? Um, but we wouldn't be able to do that unless having that capacity generally was good for the organism in Darwinian terms. It seems like a puzzle. Let me give it back the puzzle back to you and just make sure I understand it. So, okay. so the puzzle is um, we're supposing, both of us, that there may be certain behaviors that are evolutionarily advantageous to engage in. Mm-hmm. That, thanks to our capacity to deploy moral concepts, we condemn, and mm-hmm. f- let's suppose, thanks to the effectiveness of moral concepts in our behavioral repertoire, we stop ourselves from performing because we condemn. Yes. And the puzzle is, how could there be evolutionary forces that explain the emergence of this capacity to think that f- fight with these other evolutionarily generated dispositions to pursue various things. Yes. The puzzle is this grand system seems to have internal tensions. That's right. And let me just add to the puzzle, it's part of our thought that one side of that properly trumps. To, I mean, picking up on a word you used. Mm-hmm. That our judgment of what's evolutionarily fit is trumped by our judgment of what's wrong. So no matter how fit it is for you to kill someone under certain circumstances, you might still judge and treat as trumping that it would be wrong for you to do it. So that the structure does seem to me to be exactly that. Mm -hmm. And one question is, is, is it puzzling that the complex system of natural selection would introduce competing subsystems. And that gets more or less puzzling. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem especially puzzling at all when we're looking at various populations. Yes. No wonder cows and people are at odds in various ways. Right. Bring it into a single individual, and it sure looks like it's troubling. Depending on how you think of the capacity for moral thought, how much that's an individual attribute in the first instance, Mm -hmm. um, or 
or something that we get collectively from being members of a certain group that's mm -hmm. acquired this capacity. Because it, there really is no surprise that, for in the thought, for instance, that effective moral thinking is advantageous to a group, mm -hmm. and not always advantageous to the evolutionary reproduction of each individual in the group, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I'm at least, I, I haven't thought about it in, in the terms you've set it up. I, I like, I always like finding puzzles and trying to tease out what's puzzling about them. Yeah. So I have to think about this some more. But my, my disposition would be to say, you've got the lay of the land just right, and the real initial challenge is to figure out why in the world we have the capacity to think of various things we're tempted to do that they're wrong. So what do, what do, what do you think is the answer to that? What is, what is our... So if we are agreed that our sort of moral capacity is uh, a, a, you know, an evolved part of us, that it, that it developed uh, through natural selection, why, what do you think is the story that accounts for the existence of a moral capacity at all? Well, let me let me let me say first that if I if I think the capacity that's that's plausibly seen as having these uh, evolutionary roots is something like the capacity to think in normative terms, mm -hmm. which is on purpose a quite broad characterization. Um, I don't think the capacity specifically to think of things as right or wrong or obligatory or virtuous or vicious or even just and unjust are as plausibly seen as themselves directly the products of evolutionary forces. Hmm. Um, So I, I think I see a plausible evolutionary story for why we would distinguish conceptually between what is and broadly what ought to be, mm -hmm. or between how things are and how it would be better for them to be, such that the second thought there uh, plays a normative role in our lives mm -hmm. and serves to trump uh, tendencies to pursue that we find ourselves with. That those thoughts take the specific form of obligation or duty, I think, is so much a product of, of social forces mm -hmm. that that if there's a, an evolutionary story, it's a secondary evolutionary story at the level of society, not the individual. So I mean, so it sounds like you, you think that there's a there's going to be an evolutionary account of a general sort of capacity for normative cognition and motivation, right? Uh, that 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 that's not necessarily specifically moral. That's that I think that's that's what I'm thinking right now. Right, um, but uh, and, but that a lot of morality has to do with uh, you know distinctively moral norms that govern our behavior and thought are sort of social conventions. Is that, is that the idea? With social. I am tempted by that thought, but I mean to be a little bit more neutral, that the specific shape those normative concepts take mm -hmm. as, say, the concept of a virtue or of justice or mm -hmm. of property, those specific concepts are have the shape they do and are on the scene in the way they are for not merely biological reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Partly because I think there are a bunch of basically, from the biological point of view, functionally equivalent candidates, and no reason to think there was a selection process between them. Um, and also because I just see so much of a plausible story of social input in the shaping of those concepts. Well, here's a story that that, that I hear a lot, okay. that I think I that I think I I, I kind of favor is that um, it's the the kind of more or less game theoretical account of the emergence of, of uh, the specific, of, for, yeah, of of of, of a kind of a moral, it's, you know, distinctively moral capacity, which is that uh, that there are very large gains to be had from cooperative behavior, mm -hmm. 
uh, and th but there is you know distinctive uh, paradoxes in cooperation, right? That 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 when you have individual organisms that have independent interests, uh, there's all these problems with you know like uh, like why are you going to be the first mover? Why don't you defect in a you know cooperative game? All the, all these things, and so we need basically uh, specific kind of emotional dispositions to get us to commit to cooperative behavior in a way that assures our partners in cooperation and ensures that we actually follow through so that we can both, all the parties of cooperation can reap the surplus from cooperation. Right. Um, and so, th so here you go. Here's a strong, that's a strong account of why we'd have, and then when we cooperate, Right, mm -hmm. uh, there there is a surplus. Right, where there's um, more than there would have been had we been working independently. But then there's a question: once we create a surplus, how to divide it? Right, and so we're going to need specific uh, intuitions or you know the kind of default rules about how to divide a surplus once it's created through cooperation. Um, do, what do you think about the, that? You know, the, that, that I think that describes a kind of a whole set of different theories about the sort of evolution of morality. What do you think about those kinds of theories? I'm, I'm very tempted by them. There's, I find the kind of view you set out in David Hume's work, especially in the treatise, mm -hmm. um, he, he spends a lot of time on what he calls artificial virtues. Mm -hmm. These are uh, character traits that get individuated and denominated as virtues because they fall under... Uh, rules of thinking that it's mutually advantageous for us to introduce and regulate our thinking by. Mm -hmm. um, he has a slightly different story for what he calls the artificial virtues. So that the I mean the natural virtues. Mm -hmm. The artificial virtues depend on getting up and running certain conventions. Whereas the natural mm -hmm. virtues he thinks immediately tap into grounds of approval mm -hmm. uh, without conventions having to be in place. Like an, arti an example of an artificial virtue would be justice. That's exactly right. Uh, which for him concerned uh, people's respect for property. That's exactly right. He thinks, first of all, the concept between mine and thine, uh, having such a thing, he thinks, has clear advantages. And mm -hmm. he even, you know, of course, he was writing before Darwin, but mm -hmm. it's easy to imagine him thinking there's an evolutionary story for the conceptual distinction between mine and thine. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to, so what makes something yours? Yeah. How do you transfer it? When have the words you've said effectively made it mine now? Right. He thinks all of that has got to be told on the social level. And it's thanks to the presence of salutary rules or conventions. He also thinks, and this is at least on my interpretation of human, it's, it's much more controversial than what I've just said. But mm -hmm. according to me, Hume offers as well a story of our capacity to think in moral terms at all that is modeled specifically and very closely on this account of the artificial virtues. So just as when he's talking about justice, he talks about the circumstances of justice, the circumstances mm -hmm. under which people would find a need for a set of rules that distinguish whose is what's. Mm -hmm. um, I think he thinks we find ourselves in the circumstances of moral thought when, mm -hmm. in effect, we have opportunities for cooperative ventures for mutual advantage. Mm -hmm. And that it's by introducing... An Im what he calls the general point of view, a point of view we can each share for judging different opportunities, mm -hmm. that we effectively regulate our thought and behavior in a beneficial way. And then it turns out, once this is up and running, and you ask of the benefits that it generates, are these good, it endorses those very benefits as valuable. Sounds convincing to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we start with a shared opinion and we give a little argument, I think we'll end up together. But I, I, I you know, the, I think there's a, a great deal of interesting subtlety in Hume's work that's n often not appreciated, mm -hmm. and that is 
fits wonderfully with the insights of evolutionary theory and natural selection without handing over to evolution mm -hmm. the standards of morality. Yeah. Um, and I think it's uh, too often ignored. I think it's a, it's a really beautiful, resourceful theory that's so far still undermined. Yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of you. I, I, as an aside, one of the things that I, that I think is underappreciated is the extent to which Hume had scientific aspirations. Oh. So if you read the subtitle of the treatise on human nature, it's something you know incredibly long, but you know it's like an attempt to create an. Uh, a, you know, a, a mathematical or experimental basis for morality or whatever. You know, it's embarrassing. I should know what that is, yeah. but I can't recall it now that I'm on the spot. But there's there's no doubt that... I, I, I love the subtitles of uh, 18th and 19th yeah. century moral philosophy. You see that, you know, Ferguson, all these people, um, they're really trying to create a science of morality right. in, in, in a way that I think kind of got lost in the 20th century when it was seen kind of as... as Morality wasn't something you would have a science of. It was it was because this was just a sort of opinions and the expression of people's feelings. Right. I think I think that's exactly right. And I, it, well, it also, I think a lot of the upshot of G.E. Moore's work was mm -hmm. that it convinced people that no insight into morality was to be gained by looking at facts on the ground about how morality works in practice mm -hmm. whereas Hume's conviction was it doesn't make any sense to think about morality till you understand how it works out in fact in practice even as he was very prepared and, and took some special pleasure in criticizing all sorts of aspects of how it worked out in practice he, well so here's a question for you so suppose morality is for something and suppose what morality is for in the most general sense, right? So, so here's the when you know. So you explained what you called the the circumstances of moral thinking. Right. Circumstances of moral thinking is you know, the possibility of cooperation and mutual advantage. Um, now, so so suppose that we think that what morality is for, in a very broad sense, is uh, cooperation and mutual advantage. Uh, that. And and the, one of the reasons why moral norms vary so much from culture to culture and from time to time is that the conditions for cooperation change. Right. That, that, that if, if some group on the other side of the mountain is going to kill us all and take all our stuff, then we're going to need a certain kind of tribal solidarity and a kind of defensive truculence that we otherwise wouldn't need. Right. Um, so, so it's so, and so people, you know, very moralize a certain kind of solidarity that comes from that kind of disposition because it's not going to be possible for us to cooperate with one another. So it's so half of it's cooperation then, and half of it's conflict in a way. So you you have to be able to cooperate, but you also have to win conflicts. Right, especially where there's external threat. So especially where there's external threats. Um, but, you know, the, the part of morality that I think we like is the stuff that has to do not with defeating enemies. And it's interesting. One, one, a difference between, I think, perhaps liberal and conservative morality might have something to do with our sensitivity to the importance of conflict to morality. Uh, so people who are big on oh, patriotism, I think, are people who think that our way of life is under threat. Right. And that it's a a moral imperative that we have a certain kind of solidaristic identity that's going to allow us to band together and ward off threats. Uh, now, some of us think of that as actually a kind of immorality. Uh, it's because you're, it, it encourages a kind of xenophobia, say, mm -hmm. or, or sees, um, def, you know, it strongly defines an in-group and an out-group and then denies benefits to people in the out-group. Right. Uh, which which it seems to defy a certain kind a sense of fairness or justice. So it seems like the natural moral dispositions can be in conflict with one another. That that it's yeah. not all that our that our capacity for moral judgment, uh, perhaps our moral concepts, uh, aren't actually all going to point in the same direction. 
I, well, I, I, I think that's right. Let me, let me just say a little bit about what I think Hume's view is here. Mm-hmm. So as I understand Hume, Hume was writing after Hutchison, and mm-hmm. Hutchison had developed basically a metric for utility and had the view that the right thing to do was whatever contributed most to overall utility. Mm-hmm. Hume, interestingly, never embraced any such overarching metric. Mm-hmm. And as I understand Hume, his view of the various traits that get constituted as virtues is they count as virtues because they well solve a problem we otherwise would face. And and when Hume says utility, that's what he means. That's all he means, is a good yeah, it's solution useful, to it's a, useful. Yeah. Yeah, a particular problem. Mm-hmm. And as I've characterized this in the past, I, I see him as embracing something you could think of as the Bauhaus theory of ethics. So the idea is, you know, the Bauhaus slogan was um, form should follow function. Identify the problem and then pick out what should count as good things of the relevant kind by their suitability for solving mm-hmm. the problem. The Bauhaus school screwed that up royally because they had a mistaken sense of what humans needed to live comfortably. Mm-hmm. But I think Hume's moral theory, in essence, says start with problems, figure out which problems are, are collectively salient in a way that they constitute problems for all of us. Mm-hmm. And then partly by way of fortuitous conventions, we come up with solutions to them. Get a good enough solution, and conforming to that constitutes having a virtue. Different societies will face different sets of problems, or Mm -hmm. even when they face exactly the same set of problems. I think he thought the problems of justice were ubiquitous. Almost every society will face the problems of justice. But he thought, just as there are different beautiful chairs, each of which are well designed for humans to sit in, there are different sets of property rules and principles of justice that might well solve the problems of circumstances of justice. Mm -hmm. So you'll end up with variety across communities, partly just because of different ingenuity. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the case that you can end up with variety simply because there's more than one solution to the same functional problem. Right. And then you get competition among them, and then you get the question, is the competition among them? Now, we have to distinguish two things. When we're just focused on justice, within communities, you'll still have competing conceptions of what the right rules are. Right. But also within societies, what turns out to emerge as a pretty good solution? will compete often with solutions to other problems. So Hume thinks, for instance, that the, that there are in societies where members of the community find themselves with needs, where they're not completely self-sufficient, there will emerge principles of benevolence. Mm-hmm. But, he thinks, the principles of benevolence, when you're in a position to help another person who's suffering do so, conflict with principles of justice exactly when the only way to help them is to take away from people who have their own property. So I think Hume himself acknowledged the conflict you were talking about. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to suppose he thought, unless it turns out to be a giant collective problem for us all, it's no reason to think the various demands of morality all reconcile neatly. Mm -hmm. It's not that he thought there were dilemmas, I think, but he thought... Uh, there's kind of no fact in the matter when these fundamental principles conflict, as long as you're paying attention to them all. That's right. And so, and so what happens, and I think we see this, that this is, I think, I think I I like that account a lot. And I think that it actually explains a lot about what we see on the ground is that we have all sorts of conflicts between different values. uh, And there's all sorts of borderline cases. And that's one of the reasons why we argue so much about it. That, that, that it doesn't it wouldn't make sense like if you thought that all of our moral concepts um, had a kind of unitary basis and they always pointed in the same direction then the presence of constant moral disagreement and and moral change over time would have to be evidence of some kind of 
vast, widespread confusion. Right. Um, but it doesn't seem like people are confused. It seems like people are pointing out, like, so when there's an argument between somebody who's who says that, you know, it's it's wrong for my taxes to be this high, mm-hmm. and somebody says it's wrong to fail to fund a program that would help these people, um, they're, they're not, like, using the word wrong in different ways or incorrectly or what. It, they're just p- pointing to... You know, a real fact of, you know, a real consideration that has force. And there's not really a fact of the matter about which one of those considerations has the most force. And one of the reasons that we have these heated debates and and why they're so saturated with rhetoric is that we just need to, you have to just bring enough people to your side to see that this is a bigger problem than this is. And that this is what needs to be solved. So we need to shift our norms to solve this problem rather than that one. And that's largely a a process of trying to get people to shift their perspective rather than proving to them that they're wrong. I I think that's right. I'd resist a little bit. I'm a fan of thinking that for certain questions, there is no fact of the matter. So Mm -hmm. questions about how you should balance your romantic life with your professional life. Mm-hmm. There are wrong ways to do it and bad ways to mm-hmm. do it, but within a certain area, there's just a choice to be made about what kind of person to be, what kind of life to lead, and no ex ante fact about the proper balance of those two values. On the other hand, I want to leave room to think that sometimes when there are these heated debates about, say, what justice demands, there may well be a fact to the effect that one side or another is wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, Even as you grant that that doesn't mean they were using a different concept or were Mm -hmm. utterly confused. If you said they were using a different concept, then you wouldn't actually have a disagreement. You'd just have friction. If you think they're utterly confused, it, it... fails to recognize the point in arguing with a lot of the people you think are wrong, which is mm-hmm. they're not stupid, they're not way off base, they're not utterly confused, they're picking out and giving the wrong weight to something I grant mm-hmm. is relevant. That's right. And so I just want to hold off endorsing that one yeah. part of what you said and say, you know, often I think the heated debates are where there is a Yeah, I, I agree with yeah, you. Okay. So de- there definitely people are just, often people are just flat wrong. Right. But there, but there is that sort of scope of disagreement where it's a matter of emphasis. It's a matter of what you think the problem is. And, and, and moral discourse is often a lot like trying to convince your friend that you, you go to a movie together and one of you thought it was brilliant and another one of you thought it was just okay. And and if you thought it was brilliant, you might think that your friend is making a mistake. Right. And so you spend a lot of time trying to draw their attention to aspects of the thing that they might have missed. And you might actually be right in some sense. All of those features are out there in the movie. Right. Was, uh, and, and your that, friend and, is missing it. And, that, that, and, 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 and so you, you're, you can just kind of persuade them to, to focus their attention in a way that gets them to take these things into consideration. And then often when they do, they change their minds. And that's why we have these debates at all. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a lot of moral debates are like that that, that, that some people are actually tuning into real considerations that are there, right. and they're right to be paying attention to them, and other people are missing them. And if they were to tune into them a little bit more, they might change their mind. Right. Um, and, and, but it's not, it's not that they didn't see the movie or didn't get the movie. Right, or they, it's not that they don't see uh, structural discrimination right. or don't get it. It's just that their attention hasn't been drawn sufficiently to the features that they would judge to be wrong were they to see it. Yeah, and it's hard, and and that process isn't an easy process, and it's not a process. It's not, and you can't just logically give give somebody a logical argument. They have to actually position themselves in the right way and then have the insight. Right. And and perhaps have the help of someone saying, now did you did you notice that camera angle? It's mm-hmm. exactly the same camera angle that four scenes earlier occurred <laughs> with. Yeah. I my sister in law is like that. To watch a movie with her is to is to see three more movies than you appreciated was there. 
Uh, well, uh, Jeff, having a conversation with you is always uh, illuminating in that way. I'm afraid uh, our time is uh, more than up. Uh, so. Well, it's nice uh, of you to say that. It's such a pleasure for me. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thanks for coming on again. Uh, and just so much fun. We'll have to uh, do it again. I would look forward to that. I do look forward to that. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Jeff. Right on. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.